So thank you for, very much for uh, uh, the Maccabi movement, for inviting me, for um, discussing these issues uh, thoroughly as, as it needed, needs to be discussed. Uh, when we think of the of the gravity of uh, of the atrocities that were executed in Israel against Israelis by Hamas, uh, it was all um, like we know that the atrocities were of a of a very um, broad range of of torture and pain inflicted upon people, but also at the same time. Um, we want to focus for this session on the gender-based violence, the sexual uh, crimes, war crimes, and crimes against humanity that were commissioned uh, mainly against women, but not only against women um, in a range of, of uh, ages in October 7th and ever since, particularly when the hostages are uh, considered. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, reacting to to the invitation uh, brought by uh, Ganit Levari uh, to me, even though I'm like really uh, juggling uh, endlessly uh, with my role as the president of an academic college in the south and the head of the board of uh, academic colleges in Israel, uh, who struggle uh, as well uh, in trying to get back to to some kind of regularity in the way the academic system uh, uh, must work in order to, to allow us to, to stand on our feet again in the way that is uh, uh, you know, more typical to, to these people, uh, the special people that we belong to. So uh, I know that uh, Ganit and I were in touch during the, the weeks uh, that followed October 7th, discussing the um, the horrendous uh, findings that that uh, I was involved uh, with, and and her her particular uh, focus on the issue of gender within uh, your organization, I think, is very uh, important. And and I told her, okay, Ganit, even within all the uh, the tight schedule that I have, I would love to. To come and share my experience with the uh, with this distinguished uh, um, audience, um, I'm trying to to do a screen sharing, but it's it has to be enabled by whoever. Dan, you can you can share. Okay. Thanks. So. Mm, just a second. I'm trying to see where she opened it. This has become such a a big balagan, which it shouldn't have. Um, so uh, what I'm sharing with you today is is actually the uh, reality. Uh, within which we were operating in the in the last few months, um, coming from a background of someone who who was a legal scholar and a litigator, uh, both researching and uh, being uh, working as an activist for the rights of of women who are victims of sexual abuse, um, watching the, the news on October 7th was horrendous to me in the sense that I, I knew that what I was seeing was not just the, you know, a terror attack of the, of the type that we're not accustomed with, but definitely we're not unaccustomed with uh, terror attacks. Uh, Palestinians. Uh, this is something that we've endured for uh, for many decades. Uh, but at the same time, the involvement of women in this attack was of a type and immense that were was not known to us. Like it was very clear that 
in a situation in which women are at a vulnerable position, namely they're not armed, they're being surprised, uh, many of them in their homes or during a, a festival that they were attending, um, the soldier, the female soldiers that were involved were mostly uh, unarmed as well. And the, the encounter happens where, whereby men that are uh, um, covered with weapon, really uh, uh, armed head to toe uh, with a bloodlust um, mission to, to harm as many people as possible, to murder as many people as possible and abduct as many as possible in the shortest time uh, possible. It was very clear that this is a, a an ultra dangerous situation for people as a whole, but definitely for women more specifically. And looking at the at the uh, footage and and photos that started streaming uh, on social media, I can tell you that the red flags were there for for me and for my colleagues, um, like waving all over. The place. Look at, for example, the the uh, the the picture of this picture of uh, Noah Argamani, a hostage being abducted to Gaza on a motorcycle. Now, people normally people when they look at this picture, what they think is this is this is bad. This is sad. Someone is is being taken away. What I see um, from my perspective is a woman being squeezed against her will between two armed bodies of men she does not know she opposed being with her whole uh, uh tiny body is is being uh, uh, completely touched by their body all over uh her body all over their body and this is where to me gender based violence begins so we don't need to see the exp more explicit footage to understand that this is um, dangerous and problematic. And on the left-hand side, you, we can see this, this beautiful angel, uh, uh, Nama Levi, not even 19 in this picture. Um, and 19 and, and a bit more now, uh, still in, still uh, in captivity pulled by this monstrous man pushing her from like uh, grabbing her from the hair and pushing her back into the pickup truck uh, where many men are roaming inside and she's being pushed in and when she's pushed inside you can see that her trousers are uh, uh, soaked with blood gushing out of her uh, crotch so it's very um, it's very uh, reasonable to to infer, to discern that Naama has already been the victim of sexual abuse. And in this respect, by the way, by the fact that I'm showing uh, Naama and I'm and I'm calling her by her name, I think one thing is to call Noah and Naama by their names to remember that these are human beings because what was taken from them was their humanity at that time, and this is what. Um, gender-based violence is intended to do, to take the humanity out of the person, out of the woman that is being subjected to it and to instill terror, fear, chaos in the uh, population or the community to which uh, or of which she is part of. And this little angel in here um, is Aisha, um, Aisha uh, Abu El Zayadna, and she is uh, from the Bedouin community in the South. She's a Muslim and she's, she was taken as well into captivity and thankfully was released like a few days before she turned 18 in one of the, of the deals where um, hostages under 18 were somehow allowed uh, out after a, a, a very uh, substantial negotiation over her uh, her uh, wealth and and that shows you that on the one hand 
the this act of terror was directed against Israelis, and in that respect, they could be either Jewish or Muslim, Jewish or non-Jewish, but at the same time, this is an atrocity held against women, regardless of who they are. And not just in that respect, the fact that they're Israelis is one thing, but there's also a Thai origin uh, a worker who was also abducted, a woman uh, um, who was also uh, abducted. And, and uh, from what we know, many of the hostages and maybe um, she as one of them have endured the uh, gender-based violence that we discuss in here. So normally when we when we ask, uh, uh, where is the world? Like I've heard uh, uh, Ms. Fruman asking before, where is the world? Where are all the international organizations? And I'm part of this community, uh, both as a legal scholar, as an activist, I've been, you know, fighting in the, in the battlefields, uh, in the feminist battlefields for the, for uh, bringing uh, justice to to women victims of, of sexual violence. And when we turned to them, uh, we got a very cold shoulder from many of them. Not all of them, some of them have stood next to us, uh, with us. And, uh, but I'm more interested in that respect in the organizations that are, that are, uh, that, that have a, an international role, formal role, namely that they are entrusted with a mandate to, to take care of, of such uh, uh, events when they happen, to be the first to respond, to make sure that people know of what happened and to, to stand uh, with the women who were hurt. So uh, an example for such, a, for such an organization is UN Women, uh, which was not responding. And uh, I need to, to provide you with the context. I'm sorry, uh, some of the writing is still in Hebrew, I see. Uh, I need to put in the context for you to understand that there's a really fast track for issuing a declaration um, by, by you and women. Normally it takes a few hours if something happens that is very clear to the, to the naked feminist eye, maybe not the naked, general eye, but de but definitely the eye of a feminist, of someone who's accustomed with these kind of atrocities. Um, and and once the declaration is issued, there there is a set of actions that can be followed and that can help establishing the consciousness raising campaign and the understanding that this is what has happened and issuing uh, assistance in the case that it's it's relevant. Most of the cases where it's relevant is where such uh, um, amount of, of sexual assault um, is happening, which is normally in, in developing type of countries, non-Western uh, countries. Uh, and, and there the, the issuing um, um, assistance in the form of sheltering these women, providing uh, financial resources are also very important. With us, it was way less relevant, but we did need the the backing in the sense that uh, what happened was that very short shortly after October seventh the, the claim was that Israelis are liars and that this is an Israeli propaganda and that none of this has happened absolutely none of what is uh, relevant to uh, to the um, gender based violence. Which, in a way, like my, my thoughts were were contradicting on this uh, on this uh, uh, reaction because, on the one hand, it was devastating to see how we were slurred as liars, okay. But at the on the other hand, at the same time, my thought was that people still want to distance themselves from using women's body as a weapon of war, and I thought that in that respect, this is an optimistic. Uh, um, dynamic that I can look at. And that made me even more uh, um, determined to make sure that, first of all, that they know that this is, that this has been done, the world know that this has been done <clears throat> as a means for the world to, to provide the world with an opportunity to condemn this kind of 
of uh, behavior regardless of what the political context is. And the second thing was to make sure that it is so shameful and the shame is not anymore on the victims, but rather on the perpetrators who want to distance themselves from doing something uh, like that. Um, and I think also that what was very important when it came to, to again, trying to catch the, uh, to catch the um, uh, attention of UN women was that, that the fact that they were silent um, led to an incitement to hate and legitimization for hatred against Israelis, Jews, more generally uh, perceived uh, uh, um, uh, anti-Semitic uh, behavior to to prosper. So the 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 silence was very effective in this case in terms of what it caused beyond the question of recognition of non-recognition of uh, the sexual assaults. And and one of the one of the uh, uh, it, I don't think it was a real reason, but one of the excuses as to why UN women did not condemn the uh, the uh, atrocities, the sexual uh, crimes, was that uh, they claimed that there is not there is no evidence whatsoever to try and and allow them to issue a statement. Um, so first of all, we know that many times it's enough that it's on the newspaper. If you look at the example of a ban on education for Afghan women in one of the villages in Afghan, which is important, but at the same time, they no one went to Afghanistan to make sure that this is what's happening. Uh, and furthermore, when it comes to uh, to uh, sexual crimes, we we've been dealing with this for decades, with you know trying to to expand as much as possible the statute of limitations to make sure that no one requires the golden the golden uh, uh, evidence that is maybe required and, and normally can be recovered in other cases uh, of, of crimes committed um, and so on and so forth. So we, we were like going backwards in that respect, harming the whole feminist, um, uh, all of these feminist achievements that I, I I proudly took part of in the stepping stones that led to to the point where those questions were no longer asked, but they were asked um, by these organizations. And the answer uh, to that is is that their the ability to to collect evidence, to recover evidence, to have forensic evidence in the amount and scale that we normally have uh, in reasonable and normal uh, crime scenes was just irrelevant to what was happening in Israel. So first and foremost, there was the chaos. The chaos was, was paralyzing, was uh, uh, taking professionalism away, putting it aside, uh, um, making everyone ask themselves, what is the one huge mission that we now have and the answer was to identify people uh, uh to bring them to their loved ones who were worried sick about whether they were murdered survived somewhere maybe uh, uh being held hostage so uh, the identification process was very very uh um uh important and and we were we started everything with such a shortage in professional uh, professionals to to execute it um definitely no one was prepared to such a scale of of uh of dead people of dead bodies uh of bodies that needed to be looked at of scenes that needed to be looked at uh and and to to make to you know as a means to inquire what has happened in each and every house in the kibbutzim, if you look at the kibbutzim and moshavim, or what happened in different parts of, of the woods, if we're talking about the Nova Festival. So, for example, in one of the one of the uh, um, uh, eye uh, testimonies that we have, uh, we have a woman um, telling the story about how she hid in the in the bushes and she saw a gang rape 
horrible one uh, of two women. Uh, and and what the police has to do had to do was to try and corroborate it by going back to this place and somehow they were able to recover something from from the grass that could corroborate her story and this story went into Pramila Patton's uh, uh, um, report but you have to understand that the the woman who provided the the eyewitness account she like it took her a while to come forward to the police and it was a moment that they were able to corroborate her testimony and there are many such cases where uh, um, things just take time before people are able to, to somehow uh, uh, find their voice within this horrific uh, uh, complex trauma the layers of trauma that were accumulating in this case were just uh, uh, unimaginable of the kind that we would not have imagined that could have happened uh, in Israel. So war zone versus crime zone, crime zone issues were done within a day. The, the police understands that there's no way they're gonna be able to cover it. So they might as well focus on the one thing of identification and burial, um, the the fact that uh, the the attack was a one day attack. It was one day, one and a half day of attack, and then uh, uh, going uh, back to Gaza, um, uh, having it, it was a very in a very short time. So the mission was to kill as many as many people as possible, and this is why we see that most of the victims. This is also appearing on Patton's report. Most of the of the sexual assault victims were killed anyway, were murdered. So uh, uh, the ability to collect evidence when you see, you know, look, think of tens and tens and hundreds of, of, of bodies of people murdered and now needing to think of whether I should be looking into uh, uh, she had been sexually assaulted or not. Some of the uh, detectives that I spoke with just, you know, looked at me like they didn't know what I was talking about. They didn't know what I. What were you thinking? They were like, "What did? Why? What you would you want us to think?" Getting into an apartment, seeing six dead bodies. So one of them is without clothing. What can we do? We can now start, you know, making the mark on the floor. Start. We wouldn't even move the body for hours and hours. When we need to to analyze, to uh, forensically analyze a scene, there was no crime scene in that respect. It was irrelevant. Um, and the fact that it was uh, uh, very um, condensed also, as I said, made it uh, harder to detect these crimes as opposed to continuous, uh, uh, continuously attacking uh, um, villages or communities and attacking the women, which is more uh, more typical of what we see in in a, in uh, developing countries because there the like with Israel it took us the longest while that no one would imagine it would it would take but then eventually when the army was there it was done and they were pushed out and they can never come back in the you know next uh, uh, few years uh, at least few years hopefully more than that. Um, and this is why this is also it doesn't look like what we're used to see to seeing in 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 borders or conflict zones where these uh, atrocities are are happening every other time. Like think of the Yazidi and ISIS. Think of Boko Haram, uh, places like that. The first responders, as I said, many of them worked uh, operated under fire under in a combat zone. So they did not have the ability or the, um, uh, you know, the, both mental and physical ability to deal with uh, uh, taking evidence. Um, the, the, the Zaka people, as you probably know, uh, uh, this organization are considered, so the, the letter Zain or Z on the Zaka stands for identification, Zihui. But actually, they're not identifying 
they're not identifying bodies. They're not in the process of identification. They're just, they help those who do that. They collect the bodies. So the, the organization to do the identification is the police, the investigative police. So everything went again in this direction and the Zaka people themselves when, you know, they're most of them don't even hold a smartphone. They're very religious people. They do it out of, it's like a mitzvah, mitzvah that they do uh, uh, where they, um, they can appraise the sacredness of, of the Jewish body even when it's dead. So their intuition is to see a naked body and to cover it, not to start taking a picture of it from all angles. And those who have taken some pictures, some of the pictures are blurred. They're not, it's hard to, to, um, to establish exactly what you see in the picture. Again, those are comments that, uh, uh, that Patricia, uh, Pramila Patton also um, added to her report. This is why the report is also very important. I met with her and with her team and, and I was talking, uh, you know, uh, extensively on these investigative challenges and I'm, and, and I'm glad that it went into her report, even, even though just slightly, because I think that uh, it implies that she understands that under such circumstance, it's almost impossible to collect evidence. Is that Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. Very important and interesting. And you start speaking about the Zaka people, and we actually have one of the Zaka representatives here with us also to tell this, uh, uh, this story. So. Uh, no, no, you don't have to be sorry. This is exactly the time I think okay. to, to move so, forward. Exactly the point where it could be. How that works. Thank you very much. Thank you.